word hell conjures up fiery images of eternal suffering. But is hell real or just a ploy to keep us in line? Now, facing off on that issue are Dr. Jerry Walls. He's a professor of philosophy at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. He's the author of the book, Hell, The Logic of Damnation. How's that for a title? And Gary Amaralt, he's founder of Tentmaker Ministries. So, Jerry, I want to start to you. I want to cut right to the chase. How can a loving God torture people forever in hell just because they don't believe the right things about Jesus? That seems outrageous, doesn't it? Well, putting it that way does sound outrageous, but, uh, and that's the way I think lots of skeptics characterize what hell is all about, but I would put it like this. Uh, the, the bottom line is this. The only way a human being can be deeply and truly happy is in a relationship with God. Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, the only God that exists. Thus, if you recognize, if, if you reject Jesus, you reject the only God that exists. If you reject the only God that exists, you reject your own happiness. Misery is inevitable. So it's not that God is torturing us, but we are simply experiencing the inevitable misery and happiness when we reject the only happiness uh, for which we were made. Gary, how do you feel about that? Is hell real or is it just an invention to keep people in line? Well, I think Jerry is right when he says that, that true happiness, true bliss, uh, is a relationship with God. But I believe that in the end, all people will be restored back to Jesus, back to God through Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly says that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And I believe he will, in fact, save the entire world. So you don't think anybody's going to hell? Uh, the Bible says that God will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw, literally drag, all mankind into myself. I believe in the scriptures. Jerry has a philosophy that uh, was invented about a hundred years ago, and it's a very good one. It's much nicer than the philosophy of the ancient church, which taught a pretty nasty, angry God. But it's, it's not good enough. Jesus as God is still a failure. Jesus came to save the world. And if he doesn't save the world, he can't be the Savior. He can't be the Messiah. So, Jerry, is your God a failure then? By no means, by no means. My God and the God of the Bible uh, perfectly demonstrates his love to all persons by dying on the cross, offers that love to everybody, makes it available so that everybody can respond to it. And the Gospel of John, I mean, John 3.16, uh, the most famous verse in the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Gary's right. Jesus did indeed uh, come to save the world, but it goes on to say that those who don't believe, uh, those who, who cling to the darkness rather than the light, reject themselves, condemn themselves. So right after saying that Jesus came to save the world, it also indicates very clearly that some people prefer darkness rather than light. And if that's what people prefer, God has made us free. A, a, a relationship of love, a relationship of trust, which God wants for us, can't be forced. And uh, unfortunately, some people prefer darkness rather than light. Well, Gary, what do you do with these references in the Bible that talk about this place called hell? Are they just figurative, or how do you explain those away? Well, there are uh, over a hundred English Bible translations, and I have most of them in my library. I've got over two dozen that don't have the word hell from cover to cover. Now, I realize Jerry's probably using the King James or the New American Standard or the NIV. And those have the word hell in the Bible from about 12, 13, 14 times. But each time, each generation of Bibles is reducing the number of times the word hell appears in them. For example, the King James Bible had the word hell 54 times. The New American Standard, a revision of the King James, has the word in it 12 or 13 times. The, the Catholic Bible, the original one, had it in English, the Reims Douay, 110 times. So, Today, Jerry, so the, the bottom line, Jerry, this appears to be a mistake, appears to be a misunderstanding for all these centuries. The fact of the matter is the doctrine of hell has been around from the very earliest uh, 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 days of, of, of theology in the church fathers. I mean, certainly uh, uh, there's been dispute about, about the nature of hell. I mean, you can see that in Augustine, for instance. He, he talks about people who ask whether the fire is literal, whether the worm that dies not is a literal worm or the like. So there's been dispute and controversy about the nature of hell, but the reality of it has been, has been a matter of, of, of agreement. And, and if you look at all of the great classic theologians down the ages, from uh, Augustine to Aquinas to Calvin to Luther to Wesley, right on into the 20th century, there's a strong consensus on the reality of an eternal hell. Now, there's a very big debate going on, you know right now, uh, about annihilation and, and, and universalism as well. But as a matter of fact, there's a very strong consensus down the ages, and you just can't deny that or ignore that. Jerry, Jerry, I the, mean, that, the that's hell a vast exaggeration, vast exaggeration. 
Jerry, the hell of Augustine up to Luther and beyond is a radically different hell than you teach. You teach a hell of eternal separation but in, wait which, a minute, man, Gary, in Gary. which man chose to go there by himself. Clear, but there, before, but the hell Augustine, of, clear before Augustine, he acknowledges that there was diversity about this. Some people understood the fire in a metaphorical, spiritual sense. Calvin himself said that, that the fire wasn't literal, that it's a figure. Uh, Charles Hodge, the great 19th century theologian who represents kind of the epitome of classic orthodoxy, said we shouldn't take this as literal. I mean, look, it talks about fire and darkness. Obviously, this Jerry, is not meant to be literal. It's got to be metaphorical have, because fire and darkness are incompatible if taken literally. Jerry, I have dozens of quotes from the early church fathers that teach that the early church universally taught universal salvation. By no Four means, of, by Wait a minute, no hold it. Let me finish, okay, please. Okay, but you're wrong. Four out, of six, four out of six theological schools in the first three centuries taught universal salvation. Only one taught eternal damnation, and that was the one in Carthage. Now, you can go to tentmaker.org and get all this information. The early church clearly taught Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. And all I'm doing today is I'm bearing witness to the fact that Jesus died for me, he died for you, and he died world for every single one of you. Let's hold it right there. We're going to come back in just a few moments. We're going to get into this issue about whether everybody's going to heaven, because I want to ask Gary, does that mean Hitler is going to heaven? I mean, what are some of the implications of this? And we'll let you, Jerry, respond to what he just said. Okay. So stay with us. We're going to be right back on Faith Under Fire. We're back. We're talking about hell with Dr. Jerry Walls and Gary Amaralt. And Gary has just made the point, hell is a big misunderstanding through the centuries. It doesn't really exist. And everybody's going to heaven. And my question is, Gary, if that's true, is Hitler in heaven? Absolutely. If you and I lived like Hitler in, in, under Catholicism and abused by the Catholic priests the way he was, so Jerry, that excuses Jerry, his... Lee, you and I would probably have behaved similarly. Yes. Oh, whoa, time out. Yes. Gary, are you telling me we would turn to genocide if we were abused by the church as youngsters? And that would justify give me a break. it? What I'm saying is that we become what our parents and what our society forms us. I was born in Nuremberg, Germany. I know a little bit about the the kind of uh, religion that, that we got in, in, in Germany. The, the religion that we got in Germany was an angry, wrathful it's, God. It and sounds Martin like you're Luther making taught excuses God like for that. Hitler. It sounds like you're making excuses for Hitler and saying, oh, well, it's just his childhood. He had a bad childhood. What I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that love never fails and overcomes its enemies with love. Wow. Hitler, Hitler is clearly an enemy, and God is going to eventually overcome him. Jerry, what's with your love? take on this? Am I off base here? Am I the only no, one no, thinking you, this you're, is crazy? You're absolutely, you're absolutely on base. Love never fails, and, and, that, and what that means is love never stops being love, and God is never overcome by hate. He continues to love, but the crucial question is, will we love God back? Now, if Hitler were to repent, I agree. Hitler could repent. Hitler could give up his sins. He could repudiate his actions. On, on this side of life. Were that to on happen, that would life. be wonderful. But I think there's, uh, there's very good reason to believe that some people, I mean, look at Jesus. Jesus was the epitome of love, perfectly shown. And some people, even in the face of perfect love, would not reciprocate that kind of love. And he forgave them. He forgave them. Now, the question is, is that forgiveness going to be good for Hitler? A relationship is, God, is a two-way two street. No, God doesn't going cease to, to love Hitler. us, but if we don't love back, we don't have a relationship with him. That's the point. I mean, I believe God loves the people in hell, but they don't love him back. And if we don't Jerry, love God back, you, we cannot experience what heaven you, is all about, the relationship that God wants for us. You can't have a relationship with a God who doesn't first have a relationship with you. How can I love God unless he first reveals himself to me? Most of the people in this world have never heard of the name of Jesus. How in the world can they come to the only name under heaven? That's another heaven, matter, Gary, That's a yes. legitimate question. What about those who had never have a chance to hear about Jesus? How could they go to hell? Isn't that I unfair? don't believe anybody's going to hell because they've never heard of Jesus. I believe that everybody will have a fair chance to hear of Jesus. Uh, when, Jerry? When, Jerry? When? 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 Who knows? I mean, uh, on the other side of the grave? Perhaps. Why that's, not? That's heresy, according to Why? your theological seminary. I don't think so. Not at all. I mean, I mean, the, the point is this. If the mercy of God endures forever, which you believe, you emphasize, and I also believe, I believe that God will give everybody a chance to hear. Nobody's going to go to hell because of lack of information. Gary, what about those people who, who you know, refuse that love of God? I mean, they are out there. If you haven't I have seen not, them, I have. I haven't met a person who refuses the love of God. I've met a person who refuses Christian.